Uh, many of you may know Tim O'Reilly. Um, Tim is the head of O'Reilly Media, uh, one of the early publishers on the internet, uh, published the whole internet guide. Um, I actually began buying his books in the late 80s when there weren't many people writing books about computer networks. Um, he is famous for his books, but he's even more famous for having helped coin terms like open source and web 2.0. Um, his conferences have really been places that the open source world can convene. Um, that's been rare. There's been a lot of, of technical 4K conferences, but things like Perl and Python and Linux didn't have a place to meet. And his open source convention is, is a well-known gathering place where people working on this kind of material can get together. Uh, most recently, he's been doing the Government 2.0 expos and summits, uh, which have served a very similar purpose uh, for people working on getting government online in a more clueful way. Um, we're also very pleased to have our Secretary of State, the Honorable Deborah Bowen, um, who has been an advocate for putting government online uh, since her days in the state legislature. Um, if you do the inventory of California materials, I think you'll see the Secretary of State does a much better job than some of the other places. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's leadership. That, that's the policymakers thinking that this is important, that citizens do need access. Um, I've asked these uh, folks to talk with us about why this matters, right? We've been looking at in-depth issues of intellectual property and the inventory of materials. Um, but why do we care about putting the law online? Um, Tim talks about government as platform, and then we have access to government as a basic democratic kind of value. And so I, I'm really pleased that we have the two uh, such qualified people to speak on this subject. I will turn it over. Uh, Tim, maybe you can start us off. Yeah, thanks. So I want to tell you a little bit about my thinking of uh, about open government, uh, which some of us are calling Gov2O because of the analogy to Web2O. And I started obviously getting very interested in this uh, back because uh, I worked with Carl as far back as 1993-94, supporting his work. He really is, uh, in many ways, the father of the open government movement. Uh, the idea that we could use the internet to give access uh, to the workings of government, to data produced by government. Uh, but I got really very interested uh, most recently uh, after the, or during the election of, of Barack Obama, uh, just as a technologist by looking at how effectively he was using uh, you know, social media, how effectively he was using uh, technology to reach out, uh, to harness the power of the public uh, towards the aim of getting elected. Uh, but it struck me that if all this was was a revolution in politics, th that was much less interesting than if it became a revolution in governance. And so I uh, started to think more about what did it mean for us to apply uh, the technologies of Web 2.0, whether it's uh, social media or cloud computing, or these new kinds of services that are uh, really at the heart of Web 2.0, uh, data-driven services, data-driven applications that literally harness the collective intelligence of millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people uh, to produce really remarkable uh, results that we are, are still just trying to understand and integrate into our society. It seemed to me the government needed to be part of that uh, discussion. And so I did what I often do when I don't really know what I'm talking about, which is I, I organize a conference because uh, what you do then is you find all the interesting people, you talk to them, and, and then you start to reflect what you hear. That was the advice I got from Eric Schmidt, uh, the CEO of Google. He said, Tim, just you know, kind of talk to a lot of people and then tell us what you learn. And I kind of started reflecting a story that I thought, oh, this is going to be way, way too geeky. You know, because it's sort of out of the computer industry, but it really resonated, and it was this. It was the idea that in the computer industry, leverage comes from platforms. And we, we have a kind of a unique teachable moment uh, around this right now because uh, the lessons of the iPhone are so fresh. Uh, the way that smartphone applications were developed and delivered uh, only two or three years ago, it looked a lot like the way government software might be procured. You know, you get together, you put out, you know, yeah, I'm sure that, you know, um, you know, Verizon put out an RFP of some kind, or, or they worked with some few chosen partners and figured out, here are the features of the phone, bang, uh, let's, let's, uh, uh, let's run with it. Uh, you know, Apple did that too. They did a really good job of it, you know, with some revolutionary new features. But the real revolution started when they opened the iPhone as a platform for developers. 
So they built 20 applications. They got uh, approaching 200,000 uh, for features that they didn't really expect. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's a really wonderful metaphor for how government needs to work uh, in society. Particularly because we have this inflection point where we see that the increased percentage of GDP consumed by government cannot go on forever. You know, people want more and more services, uh, but they're not willing to pay for them by levying higher and higher taxes on themselves. And so we have this fundamental contradiction uh, that is uh, you know, creating great schisms in our society and in our governance. And it seemed to me that the lessons of computer platforms, that you can actually do less and get more, are extremely potent and profound uh, you know, for our society. Now, government has always acted uh, in many ways, like a platform provider. You know, so for example, when Eisenhower uh, built uh, or you know, commissioned the, the international, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the U.S. highway system, you know, they didn't specify what was put at the ends of the highways. They said, "Oh, we're going to build infrastructure that is going to, uh, you know, lift the the, uh, 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 the capabilities of our society." Uh, same thing with rural electrification. Um, uh, I think that. Um, there's some great stories more recently, the internet, uh, the uh, GPS system. You know, President Reagan in 1982 you know, made a very, very important decision to open up this military asset for civilian use. And over the last uh, you know, 25, 30 years, we've seen just how powerful that decision was. Uh, and, and it led not just to use of those facilities, but a huge amount of private sector investment. And now, certainly in the last uh, a half dozen years, a real revolution in how we have access to, to uh, the location information, this huge startup culture, uh, big entrepreneurial opportunities. And that's a great government as platform lesson. You know, create capabilities that are expensive. It was not something the private sector was going to do, put up uh, location satellites. Even the government had real doubts early in the years, was this a big boondoggle? And yet, it was the kind of investment in a platform uh, that took us a long way forward. Uh, look at weather, the same thing. You know, we get our, our weather data, whether it's from Google or the Weather Channel or from the daily newspaper, because the federal government puts up satellites, collects uh, data from, uh, uh, you know, from buoys, from ships, uh, from independent weather stations, and organizes it and then passes it out to the private sector to then commercialize that data. And I, I uh, so in thinking about this analogy and looking at uh, four great examples, I couldn't help but struck, be struck by another analogy, one that Carl was making. And that was uh, that if you think of uh, government as a platform and the, the best designed government acting like a platform provider rather than like an application provider delivering the actual end, end user services, uh, and that of course is the the, I think where we go wrong a lot with government, we've, we've started to treat it like a vending machine. Uh, Donald Kettle in his book, uh, The Next Government of the United States, uses that term vending machine government. And we have this idea we put in our taxes and we get out our candy bars in the form of you know, roads, schools, taxes. I mean, roads, schools, you know, fire departments, uh, armies, you know, <laughs> police. Uh, and then when we, you know, we don't get what we want, you know, or we think it costs too much, we, we get to shake the vending machine. And that's our idea of participation. And you know, so so you know, and, and you see that that's a fundamentally flawed model. We want to move away from vending machine government and into a model where government is providing capabilities that allow us to do things for ourselves. So, uh, so, uh, but in thinking about this analogy and the lessons of of uh, you know, the, what can we take from computer platforms and their success in driving a marketplace forward? You can't help but be struck by the analogies between open source software and uh, the law. Uh, Carl has observed that the law is the operating system, if you like, of our country. And uh, just as we've had a revolution in technology through the use of open source software such as Linux, more importantly through open source software such as the World Wide Web, people forget the protocols were open. The original uh, implementation was put into the public domain. This was this huge, generous platform creation uh, gesture, which led to untold, uncounted societal benefits 
uh, proliferation of economic activity. So through openness, we get innovation, we get an economic engine. And that economic engine turns out in example after example to be greater than the economic invention, uh, uh, the economic activity that we get uh, when we allow individual parties and incumbents to hold tight uh, to some particular piece of proprietary information or software. We get this huge benefit. Same thing is true back to the early days of the IBM personal computer. IBM published the specifications for that computer. Anybody could build them. That was why we had a PC revolution. So then you start looking at the situation that we've been documenting in this workshop, you know, where uh, access to primary legal materials is difficult, is expensive. Somehow, uh, this thing which belongs to all of us, you know, as a nation, is locked up in a variety of ways, is made inaccessible, is made expensive. You have to ask, what are we missing in our society because uh, people are held back from access to effectively the source code of our democracy? And with that, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about this. Uh, Deborah Bowen has actually been doing things about this for you know last uh, a couple of decades, and, and uh, I'd love to you know hear your perspectives on why uh, you know this idea of access to primary legal materials uh, is important, and also just in general, what are the issues that you see from a government point of view in uh, how government can start to act more effectively uh, to open things up to catalyze activity in society rather than, for example, to make these sort of, uh, you know, backdoor deals that end up favoring some small number of parties <laughs> and not, not creating that explosion that we see with open platforms. Great. Well, I, you know, I started into this um, both as a practicing lawyer in the 80s and then as a, a volunteer, I guess you would call them a community activist. Um, if you're a lawyer and you're willing to do volunteer work, you have an endless supply of clients, <laughs> as I did. And somehow I tried to make my paying clients subsidize all the hours I was doing my free work. But the basic issues that I confronted, a lot of them were just, you know, when and where is a decision going to be made at the local level? And we were talking a lot about planning and land use decisions by whom, and then what information is available, um, what does the staff report say, because there may be issues that were missed, there may be factual inaccuracies. If you don't have access to that framework for decision making, you basically are just shut out of the process. Um, and what that meant at the time, uh, 1991, let's say, was you had to drive down to the city hall and look at postings on the bulletin board. And then uh, maybe if you were there when they were open, which if you had a job was no small task, uh, you could get a copy of the staff report one day maybe before the hearing so that you were left you know, scrambling all night trying to figure out uh, how to best take your two-minute shot, which is what public participation generally is in a, in a city council or a planning commission meeting. Uh, and the city of Santa Monica really changed things by putting up a dial-up bulletin board of planning commission agendas. And that was the one model that I was familiar with that gave people access. So at least you could stop running the Santa Monica City Hall to see whether or not something was on the calendar. <clears throat> and it led me, when I got to Sacramento in 1992 as a, a new legislator, to realize that I had this computer that had all of the information about the legislature, all the votes, all the committee reports, everything, but you couldn't get access to it from outside the building unless you paid somebody a couple hundred dollars a month or a couple thousand dollars a year. But it was our data from yeah, that yeah. same viewpoint. Yeah. Our tax dollars pay to create all this information. And that was the beginning of this for me. And I, I started out with the bulletin board concept, and a couple guys from Silicon Valley, and they were guys, came in and said, no, you should make this uh, a requirement that this information be available on the world's largest non-proprietary computer. Um, and we were off. And at one point, they actually wrote a front end over the weekend, because 
the cost estimate for doing this was $800,000 for taking the information we had and making it available online. Sounds a lot like Carl's story with the SEC. <laughs> yeah. 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 So they went home and wrote up front end over yeah. the weekend. It was kind of clunky, but we went to the Senate Rules Committee, and um, that was the end of the $800,000 estimate. But there were, so it was openness in the process itself that actually moved the bill because I had a lot of resistance internally from people who didn't, who wouldn't even set it for a hearing. Control over the information meant uh, in the legislature that you, you as the legislator knew what information any single constituent wanted because they had to call your office and tell you what bill number they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had, you, you knew what everybody was interested in. If somebody got a sudden urge at 2 in the morning to look for something, all they could do was write a letter and put a stamp on it to ask for it. So that was, I think, that's one so of the... Reducing the, participation in order to uh, make it easier control. to... Control. Yeah. And, and that certainly is true when it comes to decision making and input. Uh, you know, it's way easier to get through a planning commission agenda if there are 10 people who are paid by uh, their money clients to represent their interests and nobody from the public, you know, who might, no group of 70 people each wanting two minutes. Um, because democracy is messy and it takes time and people have to make hard decisions and choose between competing interests and if you, if you set up a system that eliminates a lot of that, it just runs a lot more easily. And the, the most efficient form of gover governor, governorship <coughs> is a, a dictatorship. Right. It's very efficient. There's one person, all the decisions get made that way, there's no participation, no appeal, but there are no processes that take time. You know, you either okay the, the well in the gulf or you don't. There's no hearings about whether or not it's set up to be safe. Well, as it turned out, there weren't any hearings on that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Except after the fact. After the fact. It was fine. But, you know, I, I was struck by the institutional barriers that there were. And part of it was that the you know, mosaic hadn't been written yet. So we were, it was all you know, file transfer protocol, and we were all sitting home trying to configure our X on, X off protocols. Um, and failing as much as, as succeeding. But, so just the whole way of thinking in the way the government had grown up was that things became available on paper. But we were 600 years past Gutenberg. And uh, so I, it, it, a lot of it is just that. It's not an evil intention. It's just that's the way it's always been done. And similarly, contracts, when they were put out for someone to publish something, had exclusive rights in them so that California did not have any control over its code of regulations. We weren't allowed to distribute or print or put a copy of the California Code of Regulations online because there was a 10-year contract. I think it was Bancroft with me, I'm not sure. Um, and we had to wait until that was over before we could put our own information online. But it's important because the whole concept of democracy is that it is complicated, and as society gets more complicated, the decisions and the dilemmas are more, more complex. But the idea is that in any corner of it, there will be some person or group of people who are extremely interested in that particular thing, uh, whether it be a planning commission agenda or the rules for reimbursement of doctors for Medicare or whatever it is. And so that not all of us have to either be involved or be involved in a lot of things, small groups of people involved in very particular things will actually generate. So this is uh, the long tail theory, yeah. effectively, people. Yeah. There's the long tail of politics is some issue that some small group really cares about. Right. Yeah. And th this whole system works. <clears throat> and now we have this greater challenge with tools that have moved us from I give you <coughs> access to my information. That was the first st stage of it. I give you the legislative information online. The huge battle over that bill was whether we were going to charge for it. Mm -hmm. the, the Senate put a hostile amendment in that bill that said we're going to charge for it. I think some bureaucrat had 
visions of a, you know, a revenue source mm -hmm. for the Senate. And I went home and had nightmares about Thomas Jefferson hawking the Constitution on the home shopping channel. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, this is going to be a precedent for putting things online. It's never been done anywhere before. And if I allow this to be passed with the charging provision in it, we'll never recover from it. Uh, and so I was ready to kill my own progeny. <laughs> Fortunately, it wasn't necessary, but there's that piece of this, yeah. too, is that when you're doing this at the beginning, you really have to be more careful of, about your compromises. Um, but so it just it's everything that we do. And now we're trying to figure out how to get people who are all interested in the same thing, not just to get the information and then provide feedback, but then to communicate this way, too, uh, with each other and in a much more free-flowing, it's impossible for any bureaucrat or politician to control that kind of energy. <clears throat> and I'm not even sure we know how to develop it in the best possible sense. Yeah, it seems to me that there's a real uh, challenge to develop institutions that work with some of this new technology. You know, I, I think those of us who are technologists have seen this uh, evolution happen again and again, you know, some new technology comes in and it gets misused terribly. You know, we saw this with the World Wide Web, you know, where it became, you know, those of us remember the blink tag, you know, and just these these web pages kind of flashing <laughs> out here. And eventually the market figured out, no, 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 that's not what we do. Uh, um, but even then, you know, we went down a certain path of it, it became more and more like broadcast. Uh, you know, it was the idea. But then the market started to discover, no, no, there were different ways. You know, Google figured out that relevancy really mattered, and they figured out how to apply relevancy to deliver better results, became this paradigmatic company. Things changed. Now we're at that stage with social media. Uh, big issues being raised about privacy. I think we're going to solve them. I think in a simple way, with all this open government stuff, there's going to be a lot that goes wrong. There's going to be a lot that uh, is, is hard, everything from hey, that discussion really did need to be private. You know, if you go back and read the uh, accounts of the writing of the Constitution, you know, Madison said, we could never have done this in public. You know, there's a book uh, called a, a Few Honest Men that uh, kind of draws that out. We, we, uh, you know, we don't know the answers, but I think we have to engage in, you know, with how do we move our democracy forward into, in, into a world of technology. We have hundreds of millions of people in this country now. We don't have, you know, and this, it, you know, the, the way it was, it was back in uh, uh, 1789 is not the way it is today. We have to figure out how to grow and adapt. Anyway. Well, and we, and yeah. we have because, yeah. you know, as I, as I told one senator who was in his 80s on that day in 1993, he said, no one will use this. <laughs> and I said, it's not, sir, respectfully, it's not for you or even for me. It's about kids who are in second grade now. And that's long enough ago so that those kids are the kids who are part of the Obama generation. And they use it in ways that nobody could have foreseen. Mm -hmm. But but we still have um, the problem of silos, mm -hmm. the problem of um, government and bureaucrats thinking that it's their data mm -hmm. and you know, that they own it, police departments thinking that the police reports are their property rather than public property. Um, we have the challenges of figuring out how to handle, handle error correction mm -hmm. because there will never be a situation in which every single jot and tittle of government data that is made public is correct 100%. Right, and there's also... And it's not in the, in the private sector either, right. but the consequences are different. Well, but I'm also thinking of uh, the experience that Carl had when he was uh, opening up various kinds of... Uh, it was the congressional record. Um, so on, you know, social security record, uh, social security numbers of, of servicemen were in there. Uh, and uh, that was always true. Transparency revealed the problem. It didn't cause the problem. And as a result of it being revealed, it could be addressed. And right. I do think that... But, then, have, but there's yeah. that old saying that, you know, it, it takes a human to error to really follow things up requires a computer. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you can replicate the error at, alar at an alarming yeah, yeah. rate and speed. We, so, we had UCC number, uh, Social Security numbers in our UCC filings, and I took down our whole UCC filings um, in 2007 for about three months while we went through a redaction process. And it, you know, it's amazing where people will write it on the form mm -hmm. where they're not supposed to. And so you can't even do that yeah. with a computer. You have to have some eyeballs look at all yeah. the creative things that people did 
than our instructions. So, so let's come to some sort of, uh, kind of specific questions. Um, uh, uh, so. First of all, I want to kind of get a sense: is this a is this a progressive versus a conservative issue, or is this just is no. this non-political? Oh, I don't think there's anything that's non-political, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it necessarily divides um, right, left, or progressive, conservative, and it also seems to depend so much on where you are. Mm -hmm. So, but when when so when there's a, a struggle with this idea of a particular of access to primary legal materials, but certainly of any kind of open government. You know, what are the fault lines? Uh, like, how do people come on one side or the other of that issue? What, what are the driving factors? Is it, you know, oh wait, we still have to, we have to get money from this, or we, you mentioned control earlier. Uh, I can understand that the the bureaucracies are, uh, you know, drivers of control, but I think within, say, the legislature, what what's the, you know, what are the, the Besides. I think they are not much different now than they were uh, than they were in in 1993. One of them is security. I had uh, uh, another legislator tell me somebody is going to get into this and change my votes on all the tax measures to look like I'm one of those goddamn tax and spend liberals. And, and that was that could easily have gone yeah. the other way. Um, so that is an issue. You know, how do you know that the record that you're looking at is actually the record? How do you know that the... You know, so are you, are you looking at using digital signatures for... for well, you know, I, I carried the digital signature bill in California in 1995, and we've had it for that long. I think the market went a different direction. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we thought we would establish the infrastructure to take advantage of it. It just turns out that that's not where we've gone. Mm -hmm. And, and you well know we have a, a lot of problems that we haven't addressed with um, uh, t terms of service being in a click through and yeah. the reality of consent. And it is, yeah, nobody reads those taxes. Right. Yeah. So you know that, that also comes back to you know what lessons do we really get from technology? It, it, you're you're right when you say that the, the market took a different solution. The market took the solution of error correction, not error prevention. Uh, you know, if you look at how Wikipedia works, you look at uh, how Google doesn't give you the one true result. I'm feeling lucky is not the default mode. It's actually, hey, here, there's 10 results. If you don't like those, go to the second page. Yeah, I always more. go at least to the fifth page, even if I look yeah. at the first, because I want something, you know. That's, that's not, that's not, not like, obvious. Yeah. I'm also thinking there's this uh, great uh, startup here in, in the Bay Area called Crowdflower that works on uh, uh, using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Again, it's a lot of the, the, the work that they do that drives their business is crowdsourcing error correction, um, spam detection. You know, so, so in some sense, uh, I think algorithmic uh, sort of detection of, of forgeries is probably the way the market is going rather than over. Yeah, and it is. And I've yeah. made that point yeah. a lot with, yeah. uh, with banking because banking, you know, people ask me about the e-signatures mm -hmm. on petitions. Mm -hmm. And you know, can you compare the signature to the mm -hmm. little scrawl? And what do they do with that banking thing? And the answer is that is not how banks look for fraud. Mm -hmm. Banks, to my knowledge, never compare the scrawl that you made at the grocery store with some signature they have. Right. It's they're, irrelevant. They're, look, they're looking at patterns in the data. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and that's obviously a lesson for government. Government needs to kind of get with the technology. But, but I'm not sure how yeah. to adapt that to you know things that have crucial impact to, to some person. Um, I mean, with a banking error, you can make up for it with money. We're not allowed to make up for mm -hmm. an error in a UCC filing. Or a privacy breach. Or a privacy yeah. breach. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. the healthcare folks are, are resting hard with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I think we, we learned this morning that most cities uh, assert copyright over their laws and codes. Uh, you know, is, is that something that's just a matter of education, or is there more to it than that? You know, I don't really care whether it's copyrighted or not, as long as it's made accessible. Yeah. I, don't, I don't. I think that the legal argument about copyright is not that important. Mm -hmm. If it's there and it's accessible with no charge, you got what you want. Yeah. And so, yeah, true. It could be. You know, some administration in the future could change it. So it's always better if you have the legal underpinnings correct. But yeah. I think that follows. Once people get used to having it out and the world doesn't end, 
And there's a lot of fear. When I first had an email address in 1995, for which I had to ask the speaker special permission, because it had never been done, we were terrified. What were we going to get and how were we going to respond with no more staff? We didn't print it on anything for the first few months. I told people what it was or I wrote it on my card. Um, and there are still legislators who don't have email addresses because they don't really want to deal with that. Or they have an email address that's behind it's such a complicated web form that it's again a way of ga gating uh, access. Yeah, so do we have any questions from the audience? Five minutes. Okay. Hi, I'm Brian Carver, and maybe it's because I was on the IP panel earlier, but I want to challenge the idea that free public access is all that really matters when it comes to these codes and so on. Yeah, I don't, I, th th that's really not what I meant. I don't think it's all that matters, but I do think that in large measure, where the law goes follows people's changing views about what it should be. And that's why we're getting changes in gay marriage. That didn't precede cultural shifts. It follows cultural shifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the, the, the main point was if all we have is, is free public access and there is some assertion of copyright, then we're back to Tim's vending machine model of government, right? The, the municipality has produced the code. Here it is. We've provided it to you. But that's all you, all you can do is eat the candy bar and you're done, right? You can't reuse. You can't build services on top of it. It's not a platform that innovators can take and reshape or reuse in creative ways. Well, if, if the method in which something is made available precludes use in those ways, then the statement I made is not applicable. I mean, it has to be made available in a way that is that prim yeah, primary. We, we, we have a workshop so back in 2007. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, machine say. readable, yeah. machine processable. Right. Uh, but also with terms of use that allow uh, that kind of creative reuse. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, you know, people like uh, West have lots of creative things they do with materials they get, but that's because it's under their control. It's not really available for, uh, uh, you know, for entrepreneurs to come up with new applications. So other questions from the audience? So, uh, let's kind of come back uh, just sort of uh, just to, to sort of your experience here in the state of California in sort of obviously a fairly trying time from a budget point of view. Uh, a lot of uh, people you know, saying this is fundamentally broken. Uh, how do you place open government in the context of the kind of uh, breakdowns that we're starting to see in the accepted ways of doing things. You know, Is that I, opportunity or a threat to open government? Well, I don't think it's a threat because I think where we are in California is that the open, the openness that we've created now cannot be taken away without uh, without a huge outcry. I don't think there's any way in which you would find access to the code or various other things in California could be taken down uh, without a huge stink. And at this point, the infrastructure is in place for those kinds of things. So, But budget does play an issue in, at least in my ability, to go further than I have. And we have, by comparison, California has a great financial disclosure for campaigns. Uh, it's not anywhere <coughs> near of what I would like it to be. But I'm not even going to ask right now for funding to redo that. I'm, I'm operating with 25% less budget than I had three years ago. And we're really looking at core, at core functions. But some of this openness actually is money saving. So the more I can get statements of information, corporate statements of information, uh, filed online and made accessible online, the fewer people I need whose job it is to type in the contents of a piece of paper. Right. Uh, and so it, some of it really works together. Right. Well, so you and, and you can do the small pieces. What you can't do right now is a big new project mm -hmm. for which there's not some dedicated funding. I'm more wondering if there's a point in where the operation of our government is so broken that we get an opportunity to, to think fresh thoughts 
Uh, yeah, I made a uh, wonderful Samuel Johnson quote where he said, uh, it's nothing that, that concentrates the mind like the prospect of being hanged in a fortnight. <laughs> and, and yet it hasn't seemed to happen here in California yet, uh, despite the prospect <laughs> of being hanged in a fortnight <laughs> more than once. <laughs> I think, you know, in, the system in California is so complicated that most people, if they start taking a look at it, throw up their hands quite quickly and say, I just don't have time for this. Um, and I have to ask to what extent the initiative process, which is a kind of open government, is responsible for that level of complexity and whether there are lessons there for yeah. where you how you want to structure openness. I mean, we have carved up revenue streams into this pocket, that pocket, over here, uh, in such a way that I think when I left the legislature, the legislature had control over something like 11% of the general fund. Yeah. So, you know, I think that that is really a, a, a key lesson you know, from technology. Periodically, you do need to do it over. You know, you don't kind of keep making your operating system more and more complex, it becomes more and more It is like that. It, it is and, like and you keep adding to the software, and yeah. pretty soon it takes five minutes for the system to load, and then when yeah. something else comes along, but, but you can't load, then people move to that. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to change government. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as we're all finding out. But uh, there are people like you who have made an enormous difference, and uh, I just want to thank you very much for the work that you No, you're welcome. You do I, I just, I, I'm glad to see a large group of people who <coughs> understand uh, the value of doing this, and that, uh, and that it's become really a part of the framework for the way we see who we are as a people. And we see ourselves as having access online, and we agitate if we don't have enough. And it's just, it's, it's really great to see. So we do have still a lot of lessons. We have a ways to go. Really harnessing the power of citizen input uh, from multiple directions is, is something that I don't think I've seen a, a good model for use yet. But maybe someone who's listening to this will think about what something like that might be. Well, I, I certainly have seen some great examples uh, you know, uh, in, in crisis response, for example. Uh, if you look at the response to the State Department, very much great example of how they harness social media, how they harness interesting open source projects. Uh, they, you know, they didn't necessarily lead the effort, but they sort of created context and supported it. Uh, you know, just amazing constellation of companies, uh, that tools uh, brought together to really create a crowdsourcing platform to say, yeah, there's, there's somebody under a building right yeah. here and you know, this guy from uh, Patrick Meyer from Ushahidi, which is this project in Kenya that was originally designed for reporting election violence, but has now turned out to be a crowdsourcing platform for virtually any kind of, uh, of important real-time data. Uh, you know, said he found himself, you know, oh my gosh, the, the U.S. Marine Corps is taking a direction from me, you know, because they were, they became... Yeah, and they didn't know that he wasn't in the country, right? That's so right, much later. Yeah. Now, I, I think it's, it's astonishing in emergency situations what we've created. Yeah. But, I, but I noted at the Obama inauguration, you know, we had a bunch of people who were shuttled off into the Purple Tunnel, yeah. where they stayed during the entire inauguration. They called it the Purple Tunnel of Doom. They got told, you know, your line should go around this way. And, and it never, it never opened up. And they never got back into the mainstream of, of the line. Um, and part of the problem there was that there was very limited signal access because it was in the tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but it is the place where I want to see this develop more robustly is in the policy making context. Not in the response context, but in the context of a discussion about, for example, K-12 curriculum. Which, I mean, I think we've divided K-12 curriculum up in a way where instead of integrating civic education as part of the science curriculum, let's say. So if you're doing a, a unit on climate change, you then say, well, who makes these decisions? And class, you know, everybody has to write a letter to somebody, or we're going to do a class project that, you know, on getting dump trucks in our town uh, to run on something other than fossil fuel, so that you link 
the underlying subject matter to what happens in our government political system. The only way we're going to do that is if we get a lot of people who don't currently talk to each other, talking to each other across a, a very broad spectrum of people. Um, and it's really a big policy change yeah. to change that. And what we did was we just dumped all the civic education classes. So we give you all this information online, but we don't tell you how any of it works and what to do with it when you're in school. Uh, so, you know, so, so the big uh, challenge ahead is not big, big challenge, not just access to the materials, but also the, the hard work of, of actually making change happen, yes. of educating the next generation of citizens, yes. uh, of, of showing people where the knobs and levers are uh, that control our democracy so that they can actually uh, do something intelligent with that, it. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm past we have to provide access. I assume that in the places where it's not there, that good citizens will rise up and that it will happen. But then how can we take this technology and go one step further with it so that we have a healthier democracy with more people engaged and understanding what the issues are so that we don't get so many people saying, well, it doesn't really affect my life, the election. Which I, I just always have to be very careful before I respond to that. Right, well, with that, we all received our, our election packets recently. <laughs> 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 and, and they're, not, they're in black and white. We remove the red and the blue ink and save $625,000. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much.